Good morning. We want to welcome everybody to our service today. We especially want to welcome any visitors. I, I don't know if I spot any visitors at a glance, but if we do have some among us, we invite you to stay for coffee and rolls after our service today. Well, I think, first of all, we should just give me a round of applause. I think you're discovering now that we're training in a lot of new organists. And uh, I was amazed. I didn't even see her arms moving back there. We know she's known for her beautiful voice and her singing and her solos. But uh, Mia, thank you for uh, playing the organ today. Um, or at least, uh, I think, hitting some buttons. You had to be trained in on this. So we so appreciate it. And it, it sounded wonderful. And, and uh, we're so glad we can do that. And we're so glad, Mia, you were willing to do it for us. Thank you. Well, I have... Uh, I guess several announcements this morning. There's quite a few in our bulletin that I'd uh, encourage you to read. But uh, the first one is simply that our high school group this Wednesday night uh, at 6.30 is encouraging people to come for a game night. Kind of a time to uh, mix ages. Uh, the high school kind of just want to mingle a little bit, I guess, with some people older than they are. And uh, everybody would be welcome, but we were especially thinking maybe perhaps of some of the senior citizens in our congregation and others. If you'd like to come and just have a fun game night with our high school kids and get to know them uh, a little bit and get to know some of the Salem Covenant kids because we have a mixed youth group that we wonderfully, I think, been having about 20 high school youth come on Wednesday night, and so we encourage you to come. Now, if you happen to be a little bit younger, and some kids, we aren't going to have any kind of, uh, you know, there won't be, I guess, any evening daycare, we'll call it, for kids. But, but, uh, but anyway, uh, we just uh, encourage people of all ages to come and enjoy a game night and fellowshipping with the wonderful young people uh, from First Lutheran and Salem Covenant. And then, we're wanting to get the word out, but uh, this... October 16th. It's really a community, a women's conference. Uh, it'll be uh, through the, the, the wonder of modern media. It'll be through projectors. Uh, but uh, this Priscilla Schreier, or Schur really, uh, is going to be sharing some wonderful Christian truths. Uh, she's a dynamic speaker. Also, she starred in the well-known Christian movie War Room. But that will be October 16th, Saturday, October 16th. It's uh, for all the women in our area, although it is being held here. But if you have any questions, uh, you feel free to contact Nancy Johnson. And uh, I also believe Lisa Gatewood is helping too. So yes, contact Lisa. We're looking forward to that. We're hoping maybe to do some springboard ministries off of that too. That I'm not sure even Lisa or Nancy know about. Oh, Nancy does a little bit. I've talked to her. Uh, perhaps a Bible study for people, uh, I guess focused uh, for younger families, perhaps couples and so on. But we'll, we'll see what develops that way. And then, we just had a wonderful start to Sunday school last week. We just had a wonderful crowd, good crowd of young people. And, and uh, we just encourage you to bring your children to Sunday school uh, Angie Rennerfeld and Andy do such a great job with that ministry, and Jill and the singing, and uh, so we're excited about Sunday school continuing. And then I know uh, some of you maybe, uh, through your families, have some connections to Swaberg or Elam Lutheran Church, uh, my former congregation. I served there and just loved my time there, and, and, uh, but they're celebrating their 150th anniversary today. Uh, for their congregation. They're having, of course, a morning service. But then at noon today, they are having a lunch. And uh, I know they'd love to see you there if you'd like to come. It's at the Euling Auditorium. It's at noon today. And uh, I know they'd love to have you come and celebrate with them their 150th anniversary, just as wonderfully. Uh, a couple years ago when we had ours, uh, we had lots of people come that had ties or connections or just affection for our congregation. And then, I hope you take note of the beautiful flowers at the front of church. Uh, oftentimes, flowers at the front of church are in memory of someone, but uh, these are in honor of 
Carrie Case and Garrett Pearson. They were married yesterday. So we just celebrate with them. We're excited that they can go through life together. And of course, if those names ring a bell, I believe Janie Case is the grandmother of Carrie, and Mary Alice, uh, the grandmother of Garrett, and of course, Kathy, uh, and, and the late Dave Pearson, the mom and dad of Garrett. So um, if you run into them, you just wish them well. I think that covers everything I wanted to mention this morning. Uh, as usual, if I think of something else, I'll bring it to your attention during the service. Let's at this time arise for our opening hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of love, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. The first lesson is Numbers of chapter 11, 4 through 6. 10 through 16 and 24 through 29. The ramble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all for this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, 
all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I not conceive all of this? Did I not give birth to them? That you should say to me, carry them in your bosom, as a nurse carries a sucking child, to the land that you promised on oath to our ancestors. Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they have come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have not found favor in your sight, do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested on them, and they were among those registered. But they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them? The Psalm. Please read responsibly. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives his soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and the innocent of the great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Second lesson is from James 5, 13 through 20. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing pray songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of the faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. You may be healed. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if any among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Here ends the reading.
Our gospel reading today is from Mark, the ninth chapter. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter the life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Here ends our gospel reading. Praise to you, O Christ. And you may be seated. And before we have a word of prayer, uh, I would like to mention, I believe Nancy Johnson is having our adult study today, is that right? And we will be meeting, as usual, at the back of church. Oh, downstairs. Okay, we'll be meeting downstairs. And uh, everybody would be welcome to come. That's at 11 today. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come here today, and we just pray that as we take our reading from Mark into our hearts, you will make it living and real. And we will leave here reminded of important and practical truths for Christian living. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have to share with you one of the things that I feel so privileged over in terms of my ministry, being able to minister now for over 30 years, is how people let me into their lives especially when they're going through perhaps some health struggles or, or some other problems. And I've always felt privileged to do this. I've always felt inadequate to do it. And I've always felt humbled. But for me, I've been honored when perhaps someone gives me a call and says, Pastor Mark, I need to talk. I, I've got this situation in my life or I've got this illness, or I've been diagnosed in this way, or someone's in the hospital, and how wonderful now that we can begin to visit people in the hospital again. Um, and I've been able to do that the last few months, which to me has again been such an honor. And, and yet as I've done so over the years, uh, it's sometimes been surprising to me uh, about the things that could go wrong with the human body. We all know about heart conditions, we all know about cancer, but but every now and then, I go and visit someone, and they're hurting, and they're struggling, and they share with me what's, what they've been diagnosed with. And even to this day, on rare occasions, sometimes I'll hear of a diagnosis I've never heard of before in my life. Um, and, and it becomes somewhat surprising to me. And, and, uh, and I know this has happened to me, uh, at least in one instance, way back maybe four or five years into my ministry. Uh, I go and visit someone in the hospital. And since then, I visited quite a few people with this condition. But at the time, I'd never, I'd never heard of it before, never realized it could be something that would go wrong with us. But I went to visit this person in the hospital. And they were in the hospital because their salt levels were too low. Or I think to use more of a medical term, maybe this is still a layman's term, but their electrolytes were off. And I think this sometimes can happen a little more commonly with older people. But of course it can happen with young people also because uh, those engaged in sports, especially outdoors in the heat, you notice they drink Gatorade uh, because there's minerals 
I believe, salts in Gatorade that help replenish that in your body. Uh, and so it can be something that can uh, happen to a younger person. But it seems like more often than not, that it's more when a person has reached senior citizen age and they're in the hospital, uh, their salt levels are too low, they're giving them, of course, IVs. And, and one of the symptoms of this sometimes is, is weakness. Their legs don't work. And, and maybe they've been able to walk and suddenly they've lost the strength in their legs. And, and, uh, and because their salts are low, and I think it has to do, you need salt for your nerves to work and so on. And, and wonderfully, after a few days in the hospital, they, they seem to get some of their strength back, usually, of course, encouraged to get some physical therapy also. Another symptom of this is that sometimes, and this tends to be more uh, the extreme elderly, uh, those perhaps who have been in nursing homes, and, I, and maybe again, I go and visit them and they say their electrolytes are down and, and their salt levels are low, uh, but they've become confused even. And maybe before I hear the diagnosis, I think, oh, this precious person I've been visiting in the nursing home, they've lost it. They've lost their mind. And, and, and I begin to have my heart broken. And then maybe I hear from a family member, or even, even a, uh, since the HIPAA rules came in about 25 years ago, the nurses sometimes will still share, well, their electrolytes are low, their salt levels are low. And, and sure enough, after two or three days, they're back. They've been recalled to life. And they're the good, wonderful person uh, that I've enjoyed visiting uh, as sharp as before. And so it's kind of interesting that our salt levels can get low in the human body. One of the many, many, many things that go wrong with it. Of course, sometimes salt levels can get too high. I think some people are on a limited salt diet, maybe because of their heart. I'm not supposed to have too much salt because of my Meniere's disease, which is something that affects my inner ear. And once in a while I have episodes where I get really dizzy, fortunately not very often. And, but I've been told to be careful with the salt. Or as my doctor would say, you know, you can have a few chips. Just don't eat the whole bag. <laughs> well, I have to share with you, I still occasionally binge a little bit. You know, the longer I go between an episode, the more lax I get. It's human nature, right? Well, very obviously, you may know where I'm leading. And it's leading to the fact that Jesus in our gospel lesson today encourages us to be salty. And of course, he's not talking about physical salt. He's talking about spiritual salt. And he's encouraging believers to have salt within themselves, to be salty people. And it really can become our first point. We're encouraged to live as salty people as Christians. Can I explain a little bit? Can I share what Jesus is saying? And I think I'll do this simply by sharing with you some of the characteristics of physical salt. Physical salt, first of all, is a preservative, isn't it? Physical salt helps preserve things. It helps preserve food. Uh, that's why, perhaps, in the old days before refrigeration, uh, when they would cut up a hog, they'd make some ham, and they'd smoke it, and it'd be also full of salt. And you could store that ham, and you wouldn't even need to store it in a refrigerator. Because the salt in it would help preserve it. In fact, in the old days, it's how they often preserved fish. Uh, there'd be huge catches of cod. The Europeans to this day probably eat more fish than we do, but we still eat it too. And, and of course, cod used to be, and it still is to some degree, plentiful in the Atlantic. In fact, some of the greatest fishing areas in the world are the Outer Banks off of North America in the Atlantic Ocean. And they'd have these huge catches of cod and fish. And of course, these fishermen would make money from this, but they'd preserve it with salt. In fact, salt would be so valuable back when this was used more, before the age of refrigeration, there'd be conflicts over it. In fact, did you know back in the 1600s, Britain and the Dutch 
would often be in conflict with Spain, and it was all over salt. The Dutch had obtained their independence, rebelled against Spanish rule. You might think, well, how did Spain ever rule the Netherlands? Well, they ruled the Netherlands through marriages with kings and queens and so on, and finally the Dutch got sick of it, threw off the Spanish yoke, and they were an industrious, hard-working, brilliant people, and of course in the 1600s became the most prosperous nation in all of Europe, and it had to do with their trading. And, and what the Dutch would do, because the, the Spanish had cut off their supply of salt, they would raid Spanish salt marshes in Venezuela and load up their ships, and the British would join in with them. And then they'd travel across the Atlantic in convoys because salt was so precious, so needed. And, of course, they'd get to Europe with these convoys of ships loaded with salt, and, of course, it would be used to preserve things, to preserve the catch of fish, the cod, and so on. And it was quite a lucrative trade. It's a preservative. And, uh, and Jesus is calling us spiritually to be a preservative. And sometimes I think we can do this just simply by living our lives. I've shared this recently, but, and it's just speculation on my part, but sometimes I wonder if the apparent breakdown in civility in our politics, in our country in the last year or two, has a little bit to do with the declining number of Christians in our country. Now, probably not declining in real numbers, but as a percentage of the population. And of course, we as Christians, as we live our lives and seek to be salty, we seek to preserve, sometimes just simply by living our lives and being a Christian witness, things that are good and right and compassionate and wholesome and civil and pure and and of course, as I've shared with you before, as recently as 20 years ago, 40% of Americans would go to church. Today it's 25%. And the decline is much more precipitous and drastic and greater in those under the age of 30. And it's speculation on my part. I may be wrong, but I sometimes wonder, and perhaps the apparent breakdown in civility in our country is the decline relative to the population of the number of Christians who help bring the saltiness of kindness, loving even those you disagree with, compassion even towards those you disagree with in our population. We're called to preserve what is right and good, compassionate and kind in our country. And and we do that by just sometimes simply living our lives or being proactive in it. And one of the greatest blessings a nation can experience is having a good percentage of Christian people in it who help bring the preservative of God's kindness and love and forgiveness and compassion and wholesomeness and goodness to a society. Salt also adds flavor, doesn't it? It, it makes food taste better. Uh, and we can help, simply through living our Christian lives perhaps, help our culture, our world, our society be better, taste better. I, I, I think of an incident when I think of this. Uh, Larry and Carla Shelley were members of this church. They moved away. But way back, speaking of Elam, my previous church and the announcement, way back when I was at Elam, I had gone up to visit some people at the Oakland Heights Nursing Home from Elam Lutheran Church. And it was a cold, bitter, late fall day. It was raining. And I got a flat tire on Highway 77 just north of Ewing. But I was dressed up in kind of my pastor visiting duds. I think back then I even used to wear a tie. When I go up to nursing homes, I don't anymore, usually. Um, and I'm out there trying to change my tire. And I, I could have eventually gotten it done. But someone pulls up and takes charge and changes it. And he said, well, he told me his name, and he says his wife taught in Oakland. And over time, I forgot his name, but I never forgot that act of kindness. I never forgot that granule of salt. 
that made my day better and taste better. And then I come to Oakland, I come to First Lutheran, and I see Larry, and, and I say, Larry, I think you changed my tire once, didn't you? Well, he said, yes, I did. <laughs> now, it's a tiny little example. But as we live our faith, we can make this world a better place. We can add flavor to it. Kindness, love, and so on. And we're called to add flavor, the flavor of God's goodness to our world and to our society. It's part of living as salty people. By the way, salt also can attract too, can it? You know, remember the Lay's potato chip commercial where they would say, I bet you can't eat just one. Well, just to let you know, I can't eat just one. And you know what? As we live out our faith, as we live as Christian people, hopefully we draw others to Christ. The saltiness, the goodness of our lives attract others to Jesus. And people want more of it. And they want Christ. And perhaps they come to faith because we are living as salty Christians. And what a joy to so live our lives in obedience to Jesus Christ and love for him and love for other people that we can be salt in our world. And then Jesus says, but don't lose your saltiness. Don't lose your saltiness. And you might say, well, Pastor Mark, how do I lose my saltiness? Well, can I just use myself as an example? These will be hypothetical. Um, but can I just share with you that if I left the church building on Saturday night and Sunday and then through the week, let's just say, as a pastor, if I went out and I cursed like a sailor all week long, and told people off, and lost my temper in my encounters with people, you know what, I may as well get up here on Sunday morning and clang cymbals together, because there'd be no effect or power in what I say. In fact, this is what would be said. He's a hypocrite. He's a hypocrite. Now we all have a little bit of that in us, right? You know the church saying, that someone says, well, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. You could say, there's always room for one more. <laughs> By the way, quite theologically true. Because we're all sinful, aren't we? We all have a sinful nature. And we bring it to church with us. We're not perfect. But even with the knowledge that we're not perfect, if I blatantly was harsh and unkind to other people as a pastor, was mean and vindictive, I lose my savor. And you know what Jesus says in another passage? He says, salt that loses its savor is good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by man. And basically, it's hard to get it back, isn't it? Once you gain a reputation as someone who doesn't live the Christian faith or is perceived Again, even though we all have a little of this in us, as a hypocrite, our saltiness begins to go away. And it's really hard. It takes a lot of change in living, a lot of repentance to get that back. The good news is it can be reattained, but it's not easy. All of this can lead to our second point, and it's simply this, that we should then seek not to be a stumbling block to other people. We should seek not to be a stumbling block to other people coming to Christ. And again, what does this mean? Well, it means that I should live my life in such a way that I seek not to be an offense to other people. 
and again, keep them from coming to faith. Now, the Bible says the gospel, the good news about Jesus, sometimes that can offend because there's a call to repentance in it, isn't there? And some people, and God loves them, we love them, and we pray for them, but uh, they like their sins. They don't want to turn from their sin. And sometimes they're offended when we call them to experience the love of Jesus through repentance, being sorry for sins, and then faith, claiming the forgiveness of Christ. But we should never be an offense. We should never be an ugly Christian. A person that, as we encounter others, turn people off to the Lord. Um, you know, Paul would write these very words. I seek not to be an offense. And he would also add this, I become all things to all people that I might win the more. Meaning he takes an interest in what they're interested in and so on. Um, Sometimes I feel like I fail in this area. And I I have a sensitivity in this area. And sometimes during the week, occasionally, after an encounter with someone, I might pray this, Lord, forgive me for saying and doing that. If I did any damage to your kingdom, undo it. Can I share a little incident that happened this past week? It wasn't big, but I was convicted by the Holy Spirit after it was over. I went to visit one of our members in the Fremont Hospital. And they wouldn't let me up. They said there were two people in the room, and, and, uh, and you know, I never raised my voice. I used a wonderful, nice tone of voice, but I debated with her. And you know what? I had my Jesus mask on. <laughs> you know, my Jesus mask that says, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And so I'm debating with this, and it was an older gal. Now, in my mind, she was a drill sergeant. <laughs> Give me a moment. No. But really, in a nice tone of voice, I debated with her. I said, you know what? There were two people in his room last week, and they let me up. No way. Wasn't going to happen. And I debated some more. I said, can't you just call up there? Calls up. No, nope, can't go up. I said, well, you know, I, I drove a half hour to get here. Can't go up. Can't go up. And finally, I said, well, I think I'm just going to call the family. I call the family. I give her, I was going to give her a minute. I can't touch your phone. Can't touch your phone. And, well, finally, one of the family members came down, and I was allowed to go up. I, we swapped. But, you know, afterwards, even though I never raised my voice, I was very civil. In that way, I was a little bit salt and light, right? Very civil, never raised my voice. But afterwards, the Lord convicted me. And maybe it wasn't a big thing. But afterwards, I thought, I should have never debated with her. Because I had my Jesus mask on, right? Of course, she knew I was a pastor. I let her know that. I'm a pastor. No. Again, good tone of voice. Um, but I thought, you know, I just sort of just graciously said, oh, okay, I understand. And then gone back out, called the family. I should have just graciously said, I understand. I think I'll call the family and see what can be done. That's all I should have done. And I asked forgiveness for it afterwards. And when I left the hospital that day, I thanked her. I thought, I'm going to try and undo the little damage. Because I had this thought. If she didn't know the Lord, I think she would have been pushed farther away from, my king, from the kingdom just by my little debating, even though there was no harshness in my voice. And so we seek not to be a stumbling block. I think can I bring it down to the level of children that Jesus talks about? I mean, Jesus uses some strong words here. If, if someone 
causes one of these little ones to sin. If someone becomes a stumbling block to a little child, it would be better if a millstone were tied around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. That's pretty strong language. And how important to not be a stumbling block to little children coming to Jesus. Have you noticed this like me? And, and, you know, I understand there's acuteness level in kids and sometimes when they do something out of the ordinary or seeming outlandish, that can have some humor in it. But I know you've all seen this where maybe a child, four or five years old, six years old, is running around and they're dropping profanity. And maybe, I've heard this, even use the F-bomb. And everybody laughs and thinks it's so funny. Like it's cute. Little four-year-old. Of course, they don't even know what they're saying. Dropping F-bombs or profanity. And everybody laughs and chuckles. How funny. And I've witnessed this. You have too. You know what? I always think of this verse when that happens. And I think, what a tragedy. A child has grown up in a home Or even though they don't know what they're saying, at four, five, six years old, they're talking that way. And it's heartbreaking. Or being proactive. To not be a stumbling block by by making sure children are in church and Sunday school regularly. Can I share this with you? Oh, and we're so glad to get these little ones whenever we get them. If if it's once every eight weeks, if it's twice a year, oh, we're so glad to get them. But can I share with you that eventually, over the long run, if a child's not in church or Sunday school on a regular basis, on those rare occasions, maybe they're told they need to go. They will always view it as a rude, unwanted, inconvenient interruption of their Sunday morning routine. And when they grow up, they're not going to want to go. How important to be proactive in having the little ones in church and Sunday school and not be a stumbling block by thinking it's not important to ever bring them or to never raise them in the Lord. And Jesus says, don't be a stumbling block. And that's one way we retain our saltiness, but it's our second point. Third point is that we can seek not to be a stumbling block by getting rid of things in our lives that cause us to sin or harm our faith. What did Jesus say? If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now can I share with you here, Jesus is using hyperbole, exaggeration to make a point. If someone came to me and said, you know, Pastor Mark, I amputated my foot because it caused me to sin. Or I plucked an eye out because it caused me to sin. I'd say, I love you, friend. I think we need to visit but I think you need some professional counsel. We view that person, frankly, as being mentally ill. Uh, and of course, wonderfully, we don't encounter that. But, but Jesus is using exaggeration to make a point, hyperbole. Kind of like you might say, you know, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Well, probably not. And isn't it great to, de- to detect speech forms in the Bible? Sometimes there's narrative. You know, 90% of the Bible we read is narrative. We take it at face value. But there's poetry. There's, uh, there's imagery in the Bible in Revelation where it speaks of a beast coming up out of the sea. And you know, it's not a beast. It's a person. But to God, he's a beast. Uh, and then there's exaggeration. And here we see it. But he's making a point. If there's something in your life drawing you away from God, get rid of it. If there's something in your life that causes you to sin, Get rid of it. I shared this recently with the confirmation youth. When I was young, I 
went through a little bit of rebellion in junior high, mostly because my parents moved after the eighth grade, and, and the kids in the neighborhood were kind of doing some things they knew were wrong, but you want to hang out with the kids in your neighborhood. And, and so for about a year and a half, I, I, I'd be involved in things I knew that weren't right. I'd come home, my parents would ask me about it, I'd lie to them. They knew I was lying, and I knew they knew I was lying. And I'd go to my room, and they'd say they were disappointed. And I just thought, at some point, in 10th grade, I thought, I don't want to live this way anymore. And I remember after school one day, my class got out early for class. They didn't have anything after school that day. I got on the bus. No one was on it yet. And I just prayed, Lord, I recommit my life to you. Freshly come into my heart, forgive my sins, be my Savior and Lord. And, and I knew I'd have to quit hanging around with those friends. Because I knew I wouldn't have the backbone to say no to them if I was with them. And so I did, with God's help. And then, pretty quickly, God gave me some good, wholesome friends I could hang out with that didn't do things that I knew were wrong. But we get rid of things in our lives that lead us away from God or cause us to sin. Sometimes those things might not even be bad, but they become an idol. And they become way more important than God. And God says, you know, you need to get a grip. You need to get this in perspective. And you can enjoy this thing that's become an idol, but you need to trim it back. Because it's become more important than you. And in that sense, we follow the teaching of Jesus here. And we get rid of anything in our lives that harms our faith, draws us away from God, or causes us to sin. Lead to our final point. It's just really one sentence. As we do all this, as we live as salty people, living in the love of the Lord and loving other people and helping to preserve what's good and right and then bringing goodness and flavor to our world and drawing people to Christ and, and then seeking not to lose our saltiness and seeking not to be a stumbling block and getting rid of things in our lives that pull us away from God, we can shine for him. In Colossians, Jesus would say, do everything without arguing so you can shine like the stars in the universe. And how exciting to shine for Christ as we trust in him as our Savior. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the practicality of our reading today. Lord, help us to always be salty Christians. Help us never to be a stumbling block. Help us to get rid of things in our lives that draw us away from you. And as we do so, may we shine for you in our world. As we love you and love our neighbors and trust in you, Lord Jesus, as our Savior. In your name we pray. Amen.
let us arise and confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we pray for people that we love, that are part of this fellowship, or people that we just love in you, perhaps not knowing them, maybe people part of our wider community who are sick and hurting in some way. We pray for Dorothy Wallace, Ray Satry, Norm Johnson, Bill Johnson, Derek Bittner, Teresa Egbert, and we, we're thankful that Derek can be with us this morning, Lord. And we also pray for Teresa Egbert and Connie Peterson and Arlene Carper, Regina Culbertson, Larry Starman, John Mead, Lauren Sigmund, Barbara Ashton, Lori Kanarski, Paul Anderson, Haley Wirth, Landon Johnson, Jane Stuckey, Jackie Kirkpatrick, Suzanne Johnson, Bill Dick, Dolores Nielsen, Tony Koschel, Stacy Long, Lincoln Noble Hangman. Surround them with your healing touch. We pray for our servicemen and women. Bring them home safely. We pray for our rescue workers and law enforcement officers. Watch over them. Keep them safe also. Minister in the lives of our shut-ins and bless our youth ministry. We pray all these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.